It's nice to be here. I am originally um, born and raised in the Seattle area, so this is sort of, you know, the lovely weather you're having today is, is you know, beautiful compared to what I know it often is this time of year. Um, so I'm going to present today, um, I tried to come up with a title that would attract um, a, a fun and diverse crowd, which it appears it has, so that's always a good thing. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on the sort of intersection between sexual risk behaviors and substance use, particularly among um, a population of young gay and bisexual men. And the data that I'm going to be presenting is coming from um, one of our NIH funded research projects called the Risk Reduction Intervention for Highly Vulnerable Emerging Adult Males. When you see the term highly vulnerable um, in a grant title, you know that this was funded um, during a Republican administration. Um, because in our country we have to disguise when we're studying gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender populations with terms that can kind of navigate a um, more hostile congressional inquiry. So um, when this was originally put forth, uh, it, was, it was actually, um, what, what was our president before Obama, that, the guy that we elected twice? Yeah. Um, he was in office, and so we sort of used this highly vulnerable um, population term because that didn't flag something like gay would. So um, this is the team. We, we call this locally the Young Men's Health Project. And as you see, there's a lot of folks who played critical roles in uh, this project over time. And this was a five-year uh, funded study, and it is now totally done. Um, and we are, are finishing the analyses that I'll be presenting today. So why sort of focus on this particular population? Well, the epidemiological data in the United States shows very clearly that young, and by young, like, 18 to, you know, late 20s, um, men who have sex with men are the primary group that is becoming infected with HIV. And so it's really important to sort of devote and target HIV prevention resources to this population to prevent them from becoming infected. One of the challenges that we have is although we have a lot of behavioral interventions that have been successful in reducing HIV risk among other populations, we actually don't have any empirically based interventions that were specifically developed for young gay and bisexual men who have sex with men. That's a problem. So you've got the, the group sort of most at risk, um, and it's also the group that lacks the real evidence-based interventions. We have a lot of evidence-based interventions for young heterosexual women. We have a lot of evidence-based interventions for injection drug users, um, but nothing that's been tailored and targeted to the needs of young gay and bisexual men. So this um, shows you the diagnoses of HIV infection among the different age groups of men and specifically men who have sex with men. And one of the things that you see is that in a lot of groups, there's a fair amount of stability with regard to infections. This shows from 2006 to 2009. And the group where you sort of don't see stability, but you see the increase, are in the 13 to 24-year-old group, where you see a rather sort of scary increase. Um, and also the 25 to 34-year-old age groups. And when you look at this data more carefully, you see that with the 13 to 24 group, the group that's most problematic or most likely to develop infections is really the higher end of that, more like the 17 to 24 range. Similarly, with the 25 to 34, it's the younger range. It's more the 25 to 30. So there's something going on with this sort of 18 to 29 group that is particularly problematic in terms of the epidemiology of HIV. Um, and at the uh, International AIDS Conference that was just held in DC um, this summer, it was reported that the uh, HIV prevalence rate is pretty stable among the 18 to 22 year olds, but it's really increasing now among the 23 to 29. So it is sort of moving in that sort of later part of this period that we call emerging adulthood. Why do we call this emerging adulthood? Well, the HIV, that we, we want to focus on this group because of the epi data, but also because they're a really unique developmental group. There's, and there's been a lot of stuff written. My original training is as a developmental psychologist, um, even though most of the work I do now is sort of health and, and social psych. Um, 
But there's something really unique about this group of individuals who, they're not really children anymore, but they're not really adults. But legally, they have adult status. So at 18, you're afforded a lot of legal rights and responsibilities, but at least in the United States, we like to delay adulthood by often going to graduate school and things like that. So we sort of delay full adult responsibilities until our 30s. And so you have this sort of unique developmental period. They don't look like regular adolescents, and they don't look like adults. There's a lot of issues going on with um, autonomy and identity development still that it used to be a long time ago um, when Eric Erickson was doing his sort of developmental work and other folks like that, that period of sort of the adolescent identity crisis and adolescent development really happened during those high school years. Now we see this delay of those same kinds of identity crisis issues happening to young people in their mid to late 20s. So they've sort of delayed the process. So we think it's a really unique group. And at the same time, because they are sort of aging beyond that sort of 18 group, you have to sort of do things a little differently with them than you would if you were, for example, doing this type of intervention in a high school setting. So this is a group that we spend a lot of time focusing on. There are a lot of sort of things that affect young gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men. We use YMSM as sort of the blanket abbreviation sometimes for this. Um, regarding substance use. And this is a population that we see a high rate of drug use in. And we also see particularly a lot of poly drug use. Um, we did a, a focus group one time with a bunch of substance using young gay men as we were getting ready to develop this intervention. And, and we said, so, you know, tell us about your drug use. And one of them said, we're gay. We know how to use our drugs. And was very proud of the fact that he knew how to mix drugs. And he knew that if you took a little bit of this earlier in the evening and then you took a little bit of that later in the evening, it sort of meant for a really good evening. And it was almost sort of proud of the fact that, you know, we know what we're doing with regard to our drug use. There is this sort of, of drug culture that is um, common among this particular age group. It's a major form of socialization. It's how uh, often, and this is regardless of, of sexual identity or orientation, drug use is how emerging adults sort of start to explore their autonomy and explore some of their identity issues. And for young gay and bisexual men in particular, it can also be a way that they deal with any sort of stigma around their sexual identity or feeling of sort of isolation. And of course, lots of research shows a very clear connection between the substance use and the risky sex. So from an HIV standpoint, this is a, a huge area of focus for us. But it's not just about the drug use. It's also about the mental health. And so we look at, at this as a major factor. And, and two particular aspects um, tend to be related to this among young um, guys, particularly depression and anxiety. Those are two areas of mental health that seem to be correlated with both the risky sex and the substance use. And so it's hard to sort of tease them out and not kind of look at them as a combined issue and what's going on with these guys around that sort of thing. Certainly the depression and the anxiety can, can lead to drug use. It can also be a symptom of drug use. It can lead to risky sex. I'm feeling depressed and so having sex without a condom makes me feel better. It can also be an outcome of unprotected sex. I had unprotected sex and now I'm very anxious about it. So it's really sort of a lot of stuff kind of going on with this group. Then there's attitudes towards condoms. And, and this is a particular challenge with this population. When you're working with older gay men who sort of grew up if you will, in the sort of, you know, before AIDS, during AIDS, I don't want to call it post-AIDS, but, but sort of the, the more modern era with the advent of antiretrovirals and combination therapy, they have different attitudes about condoms. They sort of view condoms as, you know, it's just one of those things that you live with. But these young guys are really sort of going into their sexual development with enough information about HIV that the idea of ever having sex without a condom is something that they often struggle with. And this idea that I'm never going to be able to have sex without a condom. I always need to be using a condom to prevent HIV. And it conjures up a lot of attitudes. And what we see in the literature is negative attitudes about condoms leads to less condom use. Positive attitudes about condoms leads to more condom use. But it can be tough, just like working with young people to get them to have positive attitudes about any sort of, of health-related behavior. It's tough to get them to sort of 
weigh those pros and cons and come out on the side that there are actually more benefits to using condoms than there are disadvantages of using condoms. And so this is also an important area. Finally, main versus casual partners. Um, a few years ago, Patrick Sullivan's group in Atlanta came out with a study that, that really had a huge impact on me and, and shifted a lot of my research into being focused on relationships. And that was that the vast majority of new HIV infections, 68% in his study, of new HIV infections among men who have sex with men happened in the context of a committed relationship. That is, the majority of new infections were not happening from some casual one-night stand or some casual, you know, friends with benefits. It was happening with their main partner. And this sort of led us to really shift so much of our focus in HIV prevention had been sex with casual partners. Almost, in fact, the number of times I've published in those 200 papers which talked about where we excluded the sex with main partner data from the analyses and just focused on casual partner sex, it's kind of scary. We were missing a huge piece of this puzzle, which is that when you get into a committed relationship, condoms almost immediately are dispensed with. Gay men in committed relationships tend not to use condoms with each other. That's the norm. In fact, a lot of young gay men say, I want to get into a relationship so I can stop using condoms and not have to worry about them. But the problem is couples are not getting tested together, so they don't actually know that both of them are negative when they stop using condoms. They may be engaged in sex with other people. That may be negotiated. That may not be negotiated. There may be rules about condom use with other partners. There may not be. Because of that, that sort of brings another element to this. So when you combine substance use, mental health, condom attitudes, and relationship status, it's like a, a soup for how to sort of work with these kids in terms of all of the different things that you really have to focus on. So. What I'm going to try to do with, with some of the baseline analyses from this study that I'm going to present is show you how all of these things um, sort of play out when you look at them together, instead of sort of running all of the analyses of these things separately. So first, I'm going to present some of the baseline data, looking at some of these um, predictors of sexual risk taking. And then I'm going to actually present our preliminary data on the efficacy of the intervention and what aspects of the intervention, um, what behaviors were able to be changed as a result of this intervention. So, the Young Men's Health Project. This was a randomized controlled trial of a brief four-session risk reduction intervention. And our aims were to reduce both risky sex and substance use among these young, non-treatment-seeking, drug-using men in New York City. We did not want to focus on the ones who wanted to seek treatment for drug use because it's a brief intervention. It's only four sessions. That's not enough to necessarily take somebody who is experiencing massive levels of drug dependence and very much wants to change. They need a more intensive treatment program. And certainly, if those people presented to us, we referred them accordingly. The group we were going for were those ambivalent guys. The, yeah, I use a lot of drugs. Yeah, sometimes it causes problems. Most of the time, it's not really a big deal. And so that was the sort of group that we really wanted to target. And that was the group that we actually developed this intervention for. So we tried to recruit these men, which served to be kind of a challenge. Um, we put a lot of effort into trying to recruit them. Now, our data showed very clearly that the vast majority of young gay bisexual men are, in fact, using drugs and often not using condoms. So the population was there. We just struggled with getting them to come in and talk to us about this. And so we developed very fancy brochures that describe the project that we could leave at um, clinics and at community-based organizations. And you know they were very glossy and lovely. We have a, a fantastic graphic artist who, who does all this work with us and, and puts these things together. We tried incentivized snowball sampling, which is where we would actually pay participants if they could recruit eligible friends to get into the study, sort of like respondent-driven sampling, but not as formal in the methodological approach. Um, we did internet advertising, we did Facebook, we did, you know, every, we throw a stick and try to find these guys. We had one recruitment card and message and tagline that seemed to be the most effective, and it was the simplest one. Got blow? <laughs> um, we found very early on that the drug of choice among our population was cocaine. 
And so we sort of said, yeah, you know, we wanted to focus also on meth and K and GHB and ecstasy. Let's just find the Coke users because that's where we sort of got the most bang for the buck. And for some reason, they loved this ad. And um, they still talk about this ad. We may have to recycle it for a future project sometime. Um, the other approach that we took to this was it was a two-phase recruitment process. So we recruited guys to come tell us about your drug use and your sex. Just come in for a baseline assessment. We're going to you know, give you some measures. We're going to do an interview. Then at the end of that is when we offered them the opportunity to participate in the intervention. The majority of them did, but not all of them. But by sort of doing this, this two-phase approach to recruitment, if we would have just said, come in, we're going to give you four sessions of therapy, which we would never use that word with this age population, but we're going to give you four sessions of counseling, or come talk with one of our staff members for four hours about these issues. Not so much interest. Come and tell us about your drug use and your sex. For, it's a two-hour baseline assessment. Come in. We'll pay you some money. Great. They come in. They realize that we're not freaks. They realize that we're actually really um, sensitive to their needs. They realize that we're non-judgmental, that we're sex positive, that we're not saying you have to be abstinent and never think about using drugs again. Now they're a little more comfortable with us. Now we can offer them the intervention, and the majority of them are likely to, to continue with that. So. We had 206 in the baseline sample, and the eligibility criteria, they were 18 to 29. They had to be biologically male. They had to be known to be HIV negative or not know their status. What we, just, we didn't want known HIV positive young men in the study. They had to report at least five days of drug use in the past three months, and the drugs that we were focused on were cocaine, meth, ecstasy, GHB, ketamine, and poppers, the sort of club drugs, if you will. And they had to report at least one incident of anal sex without a condom with a positive or unknown status main partner, so a, a, a serodiscordant main partner, or any casual partner in the past three months. And we classified sex with any casual partner as a potential risky sex act. Because of Patrick Sullivan's data and because of this idea that if you're with a casual partner, even if they've said, yeah, I'm negative too, how do you know? And how do they know? So our argument was any casual sex, regardless of whether that casual partner told you their status was positive, told you their status was negative, or told you I don't know their status, or in fact you never talked about it in the first place, we're going to classify all of those as a potentially risky partner. We just thought that that was the most um, appropriate sort of approach to take when they really don't know the level of risk. So participants would come in, they would do a baseline assessment, and then we had follow-ups at 3, 6, 9, and 12 months. They would do an audio CASI where they would um, answer the questions on the computer with headphones that would read the questions to them to address any literacy issues that might have been happening. And then they did a 30-day interviewer-administered timeline follow-back calendar. And this is where we go day by day for the past 30 days, and for every day we capture all the drugs that they used and all the sex that they had. I just want to point out, this in and of itself is an intervention. You sit anybody down, and they map out all of their sex and drug use behaviors for the past 30 days. The typical response is, oh, shit, I'm using a lot of drugs and having a lot of sex. And there's a part of me that thinks we should just like subject every person at risk to doing this interview. We may have an effect on behavior just because of this. It, it, it is a strong kind of thing. And it's different when you see it visually. We've tried a lot of different administration approaches. And the one that we keep coming back to is this face-to-face -face with an interviewer administering it, helping you through the calendar day by day. There's something visual about looking at this that make people go, wow, um, something's going on here. So then, again, once they did the baseline, then they were given the option to be randomized, uh, to join the intervention trial and be randomized to either the motivational interviewing or an education control condition after baseline. And I'll talk about the intervention next. So let me do the baseline findings first. We looked at the baseline data from all the participants that, that completed the baseline, regardless of whether they agreed to participate in the intervention. And we really wanted to look at both the independent and the interactive effects of all of the sort of things that I talked about that are, are relevant to this population. So we looked at substance use on a day of sexual activity using the timeline follow-back calendar. We looked at the men our mental health variables were the anxiety and depression subscales from the BSI. 
We had a benefits of unprotected sex scale, which was how we conceptualized the attitudes about condom use. And then we were also able to code whether they had a main partner sex day, um, or was it a casual partner sex day, or was it a sex day in which they had sex with both a main and a casual partner. Um, main partners were defined as being in a romantic relationship with another man for at least 90 days. So we didn't want somebody, you know, they met last night that they now feel romantic about and calling that person a romantic partner. 90 days is a very sort of arbitrary kind of thing, like what, 89 days isn't enough to know you're in a relationship, but somehow something magical happens on that 90th day. I know it's, but we had to pick something. Um, and other folks have sort of used that 90 day mark, so we sort of went along with that. Um, the, the ones who were, um, if they were having sex with a, a known negative or unknown status partner, we kept them in. If, if they had an HIV positive main partner, a main partner that they knew was HIV positive because that partner had told them that, we excluded them from these analyses because a negative man having sex with a known HIV positive main partner, totally different dynamic. And so, and, and we didn't have enough of them to sort of analyze separately to see what those dynamics might be. Um, and also for it to be a main partner sex day, they had to have had sex with that main partner in the past 30 days. So, then our outcome for these analyses was simply the odds of not using a condom on a day in which they had sex. Because we have the day level data, we're able to do the day level analyses and looking at all of this. So we use generalized estimating equations um, to assess the relative odds of not using a condom on a day when a participant had sex, adjusting for our various predictors. And this gives you a sort of a little overview of the demographics. Our sample was about 35% white, and the rest of the sample were men of color. Um, a lot of them, uh, they were fairly educated um, in terms of college, uh, in terms of sexual orientation. 90% of them were gay. The other 10% were identified as bisexual. Um, and 18% of them were in a relationship, and the rest were single. So this is just sort of the basic level data on, on the sex. And, and what you see is, is um, th they were having a fair amount of sex. So the the... No condom sex day for the full sample, when you look at everybody in terms of that, more than 85% of them had at least one day in which they did not use a condom. So you see for this population, that's, that's sort of the norm. The, the, the average person has not had a condom. Now keep in mind, for eligibility, you had to report at least one act without a condom for the past 90 days. But because we've only got timeline data for the past 30, that's why these are not 100%. Right, because 100% of them reported at least one unprotected sex that's in the last 90, but about 80, 88 reported that for the past 30 days. And then, if they were partnered, um, the the 17% of them who had a main partner sex day, they also were very unlikely to be using condoms. More than 88% of them were not using condoms as well. This is the percent of participants using each of the different drugs and the mean number of drug days in the past 30. And so, again, you don't see 100% reporting any drugs because although they had to have had five days of drug use in the past 90, they didn't necessarily have to have that in the past 30. Although most of them, more than 85% of the sample, um, did report uh, drug use day in the past 30 days and on average six and a half days of drug use. Again, this is where you see that cocaine is sort of the drug of choice among this population with ecstasy and meth sort of um, about half as much and then GHB and ketamine at much lower rates. So these are the independent odds of not using a condom on a day when drugs were used. And the, the sort of the one for any drug, the ecstasy effect was not significant. So there actually wasn't a significant relationship between an ecstasy drug use day and not using a condom on that day. For the any drug use day, what you see is that if, if any drug was used on a sex day, then participants were a little more than twice as likely to not, using a, not use a condom than on a day when drugs were not used. And then we found that all of the rest of the drugs, cocaine, GHB, meth, and ketamine, all of those were significant. So they were, again, twice as likely for cocaine, 2.3 times as likely for GHB, 2.4 for meth, and a little over four times as likely to not use a condom on a ketamine day. The ketamine data is a little weird because that was also the lowest number, but what we see is that not very many guys use ketamine, but if they do, 
they're really likely to be having unsafe sex on a ketamine day. Okay, lots of colors and lots of arrows, right? So let me sort of try to walk you through this. This is, this is where um, the great statisticians that I work with try to graphically represent what's happening with regard to all of these variables at the same time. So this is a graph of the log odds of not using a condom. And the first thing is the, the distance between the maroon and the blue lines, as well as the distance between the green and the purple lines, shows just the effects of using drugs on a sex day. And this, so this is that over twice as likely to not use a condom on a day the drugs were used, right? So that's just the drug effect controlling for everything else. Now, the distance between the blue and green lines and the distance between the maroon and purple lines is the effect of having sex with a main partner on a given day. So participants who had sex with a main partner were over four times likely to not use a condom than participants who had sex with a casual partner. So main partner sex much less likely to use condoms. We know that from other literature. The slope of each line shows the effect of increases in the BSI scores. So the depression, th this one we're um, showing specifically for depression, but it's the same pattern when we look at anxiety separately. And what we see is each standardized increase in depression score increases the odds of not using a condom by about 1.3 times. So the more sort of depression happens, the more likely to not use a condom. Now here's where it gets messy. You have to look at the direction of the slopes. This shows the interaction. The relationship between having sex with a main partner and condom use gets moderated by depression. So as depression scores increase for those who are having a main partner sex day, the odds of not using a condom decrease by a factor of about seven, which is a big decrease. So in other words, on a day you're having sex with a main partner, if you're not depressed, you're less likely to use a condom. Happy partnered people are not using condoms with their main partners, right? We think depressed people may be more likely to be using a condom with their partner because maybe they're depressed because they're concerned their partner is doing something on the side and maybe that's why they're using a condom in the first place. I mean, we don't know, but that's sort of a logical hypothesis. But the, the sort of inverse is that people who have a casual partner sex day are more likely to use a condom when they're not depressed or anxious. So happy people having sex with casual partners are more likely to use a condom. So it, it's, you've got a different sort of thing happening. And this is again, from our perspective, why you can't not look at this sort of relationship status and this relationship factor in running these analyses. When we do this, that whole sort of relationship gets lost entirely and you don't really see that type of um, moderation. So this is then trying to look at the benefits of unsafe sex, so sort of the advantages of using condoms, if you will. And what this shows is we don't see the same moderation effect um, related to whether it's a main partner or a casual partner. And so this is the drug effect. The, the drug effect is still there, the, um, that the uh, drugs continue to have a strong effect on condom use, even whether you think condoms are a great thing or not. For the purple arrows, this is, this is the partner effect. Again, having sex with a main partner, much less likely to be using a condom, regardless of whether or not you perceive a lot of benefits to using condoms. And then the fact that the slopes move in the same direction shows the lack of moderation. So the, the, the moral of the story, though, is that the more you perceive that condoms are a bad thing, the greater odds of not using a condom on a sex day. Holding drugs and partnered sex constant. So we still, even when we control for those things, we see this effect. What this tells us is that we really need to work with these young men to get them to see more benefits of using condoms, to somehow sort of enhance their perceptions that condoms are not such a bad thing after all. This is just the, the model sort of uh, using the, um, the specific betas um, and shows you the, the interaction effect at the bottom, which is the BSI by the main partner sex day. So what do we think this means? Well, 
clearly drug use and clearly perceiving benefits of sex without a condom were associated with unprotected sex days, independent of everything else. And then the BSI scores moderated the effects of having a main partner sex day. So we see this, this happy people, happy partnered people, increased odds of not using a condom, and then happy people who were with casual partners do increase their likelihood of using a condom. So, and, and regardless of whether they're having sex with a main or a casual partner, if they view a lot of benefits about unprotected sex, they're gonna do unprotected sex. And this is one of those things that, that again, sort of putting on my developmental psychologist hat, is pretty characteristic among emer emerging adults. In the face of huge amounts of risks, they know the risks, right? If they see benefits of doing something, they're gonna do it. Whether it's using drugs, whether it's not using a condom, whether it's not, you know, putting on sunscreen, it doesn't matter the behavior. Older people, once we age a little bit, we tend to weigh the risks more. It's like, yeah, I really like a tan, but I really don't wanna end up like, you know, that woman that turned all brown because she spent too much time in the tanning booth. Younger people can't weigh that as much. They tend to focus on the immediate benefits and the sort of immediate gratification. So this is a challenge in working with these folks around what can we do to sort of enhance the perceived benefits of condom use. The other big thing to come out of this is, again, no matter how you sort of cut the data, substance use was always still the big thing. If they used drugs on that day, they were much less likely to use a condom on that day. And this was a robust finding, no matter sort of how we analyze the data. And so the drug use aspect needs to be a major focus of our intervention work. Um, again, though, also doing something about these perceived benefits needs to be integrated into the interventions. And then we have to continue to address mental health. Um, if we can improve mental health among those having sex with casual partners, we're gonna increase their condom use. Um, but then we need to understand how do we improve the mental health of people having sex with their main partner without decreasing their condom use because we know from Patrick Sullivan's study that they could still be at risk. That's a whole other area of couples research that we need to pursue. So we've run the preliminary efficacy data and I'm gonna sort of share that with you. Keep in mind that this is our first pass at this data, so it's still um, being tinkered with, but we're pretty, we're pretty comfortable. We're, we're in the process of writing this up now, so we're, we're pretty good with this. Um, motivational interviewing, how many of you are familiar with motivational interviewing? Okay, it, it's become this huge thing, right? It, it's this approach of doing therapy or counseling or interaction with another person that basically um, is very client-centered, non-judgmental, and it's about trying to take them where they are at, the, at their stage of readiness to change and enhance their motivation to just go another step. Not if you're the type of person who's like, you know what, I really like my drug use and am really not interested in giving it up, maybe I'd like to cut down a little bit, Motivational interviewing says, okay, then let's focus on that. Motivational interviewing says, you know, what kind of changes do you want to make in these behaviors? Not these are the changes I think you should make, which is a much more directive kind of, you know, I'm the expert, I'm going to tell you what's the right thing to do approach, which does not work with adults, let alone younger people who don't like to be told what to do. So the, the data has shown this motivational interviewing approach tends to work pretty well with younger people because it meets them where they are and treats them with respect. And it's been shown to be very effective for a lot of different things, but has never been applied to sex risk and substance use with young gay and bisexual men. So our goals, if they were in the MI condition, our goals were to provide information about club drugs and high-risk sex because we don't feel like they can even enhance their motivation unless they have the basic knowledge down, enhance their motivation and sense of personal responsibility, assess their particular stage of readiness to change and then individually tailor the intervention accordingly, and set goals and plans to reduce risk for those who were ready to change. If they weren't randomized to the intervention, they were randomized to a four session attention control. And this is one of my big things as an intervention researcher. I can't stand it when we take this intervention that we've developed and we compare it to nothing. Because guess what? Something almost always works better than nothing. And so what does that tell you? That tells you meeting, coming into an office four times, even if your therapist sucked, 
is better than not coming into an office four times. That to me isn't a huge finding. What I want to do is compare my four session intervention to four sessions of something else. And something else in our case was basic education about the same behaviors. Because I also think it's a problem if you have known guys at risk for HIV infection. These are, not, these are guys who are using drugs and report at least one unprotected anal sex act. So these are risky guys. To give them a comparison condition focused on diet and nutrition, in my perspective, is unethical. And so we always do an, an attention control that addresses the same behavior. So what we're really testing is sort of education and motivation versus education alone. Because the argument is if education alone is enough, then we don't need to do the other piece, right? It, this is the type of thing that they would get from their doctor if they went to a community-based organization, sort of health education at its sort of basic point. So. Again, it covered the factual aspects of club drug use and HIV risk. The educators, though, had a very strict script that they had to adhere to. And then we showed video segments. So they would sit and they would watch a segment of, of a video about these two behaviors. And then there were structured discussion questions that the educator posed. What the educator did not do was um, focus on their motivation or do any sort of goal planning. The, the educators did not say, what kind of changes do you want to make in these behaviors? Because that's characteristic of our intervention. So this was sort of just the facts, if you will. And we did a lot of supervision with our educators because we find that some of our staff just naturally have that need to try to help people. We'd have to slap them and tell them, stop doing that. Just, just give them the facts. It's very didactic. It's very basic. So the MI sessions were delivered by masters and PhD level counselors who had, were very trained. Um, the education sessions were delivered by basic research assistants. Um, they had, uh, some of them were working on their bachelors, some of them had a bachelors, but they were not at the masters or PhD level. Um, we also then reviewed about 75 to 80% of the sessions um, that were re reviewed in part for supervision purposes to make sure that our MI therapists were doing MI and that our educators were not doing MI and were just doing basic education. And they had weekly individual and bi-weekly group supervision to sort of help keep them on task. When we're doing a, a, a study like this for the first time, we spend a lot of effort and a lot of time on this because what we don't want is to have sort of our conditions screwed up because of drift some way, so that the MI people stop doing MI or the education people stop just being didactic. So we spent a lot of, of effort on this. So then we look at the efficacy of the four sessions of MI versus the four sessions of education, again, focusing on the two target behaviors, reducing substance use risk and reducing sexual risk. And we have our baseline and three, six, nine, and 12 month follow-ups. So they had, they had three months to complete all four sessions. So they had to complete those four sessions between the baseline and the three-month follow-up. And this is sort of the, the structure of it. One of the things that I want to point out, I, I had mentioned earlier when I was talking about the, the baseline data, how, what a challenge it was to recruit these folks. As you see, we assessed over 1,200 people by phone. Um, and then 266 actually came in, gave informed consent. Um, 34 of them were actually ineligible once they came in. Our phone screener was a preliminary eligibility. Um, 31 of them declined randomization. 26 were randomized but didn't come back. So we end up randomizing 175. Um, and our retention was pretty good um, over time. And the average number of sessions in both groups was about three and a half. And it wasn't different. One of our concerns always in a trial like this is you know, if, the if they love the motivational interviewing thing more than the education, are they going to be less likely to come back for the education? So we made sure that the education was interesting enough and engaging enough. So it, it, it's like finding that fine line between I'm going to give you didactic information, but I still, uh, these are young gay men, so we still made it fun, and we think that worked. So again, we go back to using generalized estimating equations because we want to focus on the day-level data. Um, we're, because of the baseline stuff because of all of the work that we've done to really show this day level connection between the behaviors, we really want to look in terms of from an outcome perspective on those day level associations. So we have condition, treatment versus education. We have drug use and we have time that we're looking at. 
And then we looked at odds of not using a condom with a casual partner. For this level, we're just looking at the casual partner data. We are going to go back and look at the main partner data because we do have enough folks um, to run some preliminary stuff on those. Um, odds of, not, of using drugs and then the odds of using a condom on a drug day. So the, the intersection that the day level data affords us to look at. We included that as a third outcome. So this is any drug use in the past 30 days by condition with the motivational interviewing group in blue and the education group in red. And so here's what's happening at the group level, right? Everybody gets better. Everybody cuts down on their drug use over time. Both, both groups significantly decreased their drug use. But if you look at the green arrows, those in the MI group showed a significantly greater decline particularly at the six and nine months, at the 12 month data, it was almost significant. Um, but what we see is that the MI condition, uh, folks experienced a 26% reduction in drug use days if you go from baseline all the way out to 12 months. And the participants in the education condition experienced a 19% reduction in drug use days, which still isn't bad. I mean, a 19% reduction in any day in which drugs was used, we like, we like a 26% reduction better. And when we look at the sort of individual, so this is for any guy on an average day. And what we see is that if he's in the MI condition, he's 18% less likely to use drugs on a given day than if he's in the control condition. So although everybody got significantly better, the folks in the motivational interviewing group got even more significantly better. And so this is our sort of test of is the motivational interviewing over and above the education enough of a difference? And we think that an 18% better outcome is. So this is what's happening at the group level in terms of unprotected anal sex. And again, we see the same thing, which is that both groups um, got better over time. The education group from baseline to 12 months experienced a 38% reduction in unprotected anal intercourse acts. And the motivational interviewing guys reported a 51% reduction. So they cut their unprotected anal intercourse by half, whereas the other ones only by about a third. And again, that we, we see, and this is sort of characteristic, you see a, a real quick drop off in everybody because that period from baseline to three months is the period during which they were coming in to see us four times. So it's sort of when this stuff is the most kind of salient. At the point of three months, they still come back in for assessments, but they're not getting any sort of content. They're, they're not getting boosters or anything like that. We think in future studies we should try that to see if we can kind of sustain the effects. Because one of the things we see with the education is that they have this weird rebound thing at nine months that we're still trying to figure out what exactly happened um, with them. But they still, nobody ever goes back to the level that they were at baseline. So everybody always still stays better, but something weird was going on around nine months, so we're not quite sure what. Um, so again, when we look at, at the significant difference between the success of the MI condition versus the success of the education condition, the participants in the MI group were 24% less likely than those in the education condition to report unprotected anal sex um, for any of the past 30 days. So it was, a tw it was almost a quarter better outcome for those guys. So. Again, these are the preliminary stuff, but what we continue to come back to is it's about substance use and that substance use is the major factor related to risky sex among these guys and should be a primary target of prevention. In fact, what we've, we've just begun to look at the, uh, I'm not presenting this data because we're still uh, fixing a few things about it, but when we look at the, the drug by sex interaction, it's all about the drugs. It, it, again, it just seems to be something happens on a drug use day that condoms go out the window, regardless of which condition they're in. Um, and even the success over time seems to be driven by the reductions in drug use. And so we, when we see that 50, uh, we had a 50% less rate of unprotected anal sex with the guys in the MI condition, most of that was attributed to the days on which they were no longer using drugs. And so there's a part of us that's now considering if we're going to pitch this intervention to young gay and bisexual men, do we even sort of address the risky sex? 
or do we just really zero in on the drug use? Interestingly, in, and we've, we've done some sort of follow-up stuff with, with focus groups of other men now, and we say, you know, would you rather come in and talk to a counselor about unprotected sex or about drug use? Most of them say they'd rather come in and talk to somebody about drug use. And so we're like, great, then we should run with that. Because we're concerned that this idea that you've got to come in and talk about your sex may be actually scaring some of the people who could benefit most from this intervention away. Um, but by really zeroing in on the drug use, that seems to be having a huge effect in and of itself on reducing the risky sex days. Um, so again, the decreases in unprotected sex could be indirectly targeted just by focusing on drugs. Um, so the four sessions of MI resulted in a 26% reduction in drug use days and a 51% reduction in the UAI, whereas education only resulted in a 19% reduction in drug use and a 38% reduction in UAI. And so MI produced an 18% greater reduction in drug use and a 24% greater reduction in UAI. Now, we still have to do a bunch of different analyses. We have to look at intervention effects. Is it, is it possible that we had a couple of really great motivational interviewing people that are somehow skewing the results? Or conversely, did we have a couple that were really bad that maybe the results are even better than we think? Um, we have analyzed dose, and dose doesn't seem to be playing um, much of a role, mostly because the vast majority of them got between three and four sessions. So we don't see a huge dose effect. Um, but then what we're also getting ready to look at are what things might be moderating the effectiveness of the intervention. So the, the preliminary stuff, I, I got an email um, earlier this morning from our statistician on this, it looks like depression is serving as a, a moderator so that the intervention was actually more effective for people who had higher levels of depression. Um, which makes sense. MI is all about forming this sort of connection, making sure that the person feels like you're there for them, that you're supportive, that you're not judging them, that you're treating them with respect. If somebody's feeling a little depressed, just that kind of therapeutic alliance could potentially make somebody feel a little better. So we need to explore more of those um, covariates and moderators of intervention efficacy. So again, both groups improved over time. Um, but the MI was significantly more efficacious than the education in reducing the risk. The one nice sort of thing I like about this is what it says is if, if you don't have master's or PhD level trained therapists to do motivational interviewing, then at least give them education. Because even education can have some effect. And some effect is obviously better than no effect. Um, we're going to go back and try to apply a cost analysis approach to this to actually see, because obviously, right, a master's or PhD level trained therapist is more expensive than a bachelor's level trained health educator. We're going to go back and see, does the cost of using the higher trained person, does the, is it worth the difference that we see in the effectiveness between the two conditions? And we can't, we, we brought in a, a cost effectiveness person to help us run those analyses to see what we might be able to say about that. Um, again, man, it's all about drug use with these guys. It, the drug use seems to be the major thing driving their use of condoms. And the thing that, that I think is important is, I mean, these are the group most likely to be seroconverting. They're young, they're reporting unprotected sex, they're using drugs. And yet, with a brief four-session intervention, we were able to have a pretty big effect on cutting in half their unprotected anal sex acts. Um, obviously, if we had more sessions with them, we might have had a bigger effect. But I worry that the more sessions we try to force on them, the more we're going to see drop off. They're going to, you know, saying I'm going to commit to coming and talking to you four times about this is a lot easier than saying I'm going to come and talk to you eight times or I'm going to come and talk to you about this every week for the rest of my life. That kind of stuff is way too overwhelming for an 18 to 29 year old. Um, but this sort of brief intervention. In the future, might we be able to scale it back even, see what we could do with two sessions? Um, we don't know. That's sort of the next steps in terms of what we might explore with, with what do we do with this particular intervention. Um, so I wanted to talk for 50 minutes, and I, my timer says that I'm done. So um, I'd love to uh, take questions. Thank you. Sessions. Ah, that's a great question. So did, did any of our participants ask for more than four sessions? Yes. 
Yeah. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we dealt with a lot in supervision with our therapists was the closure and the termination in that fourth session. Um, it was very hard for some of these young men. And it was particularly hard for the young men of color. Mm -hmm. And we, we've seen this in our other motivational interviewing um, interventions. When you're dealing particularly with gay men of color, they're just dealing with a whole lot of, of baggage and stigma and issues. And they talk about being discriminated against, not just for being gay, not just for using drugs, but also because they're black or because they're Latino. And they talk about getting feeling stigmatized and feeling judged and discriminated against by their medical providers, by other people who we would hope are not treating them like that. And so a lot of, the, it, it was not uncommon that we would hear from them, this is the first time in my life I've ever been able to talk to anybody about these issues and not feel judged. And it was actually a huge issue for our therapists. I mean, we spent a lot of, we had a lot of process group time with our therapists because it was, it was having an effect on them. Um, because we had participants who would cry on the fourth session and not want it to be over. Um, and so, absolutely. Did we see that with the education guys? A little bit. But for the most part, they were like, okay, I'm educated, I can go home. Um, but there was, we also looked at, at, there's a measure of therapeutic alliance, of how connected a participant feels towards the person that they've been doing these four sessions with. And we gave it to folks in both conditions. And we see much higher rates of that alliance among those in the MI group than in the education group. They, they formed a connection to their therapist that they did not form to their educator, which is expected. I mean, what you're dealing with in those sessions is very different than just getting didactic information. At the same time, they didn't hate their educators, which is why they kept coming back. They didn't feel judged by their educators, um, but it's different than sort of having that really strong connection. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I work uh, with Wayne and Daniel and Darren at the Health Initiative for Men. Vancouver. So this is all really interesting work for us because, of course, we're looking at behavioral interventions, also with the largest distributor of things like condoms and ticket guys in Vancouver. So um, great presentation. I had I, I thought what was most interesting at the beginning you talked about the soup, and um, for me that is the um, kind of the most difficult, but also the most interesting part of your presentation is because it really is a number of variables that are impacting. UAI, right? Um, so you discussed them, drug use, beliefs about condoms, whether or not your partner is single, happy or unhappy, that's all impacting. But then your conclusion was drug use. Yeah. So I'm Drugs just are the noodles in my soup. Can you take me there a little bit about like, because I would think guys who are less happy may be using more drugs and those are the guys who may be in, so I, do you mind just walking me through? Yeah, no, it, it, it's... I mean, again, drugs are the noodles in the soup. They're the biggest contributor. They're the biggest factor. And because we can look longitudinally at it, it the, the, the driving force over time in the behavior change is the drug use. It, is depression playing a role? Absolutely. Is the relationship status playing a role? Absolutely. Are condom attitudes playing a role? Absolutely. But those are all playing a secondary role to the drug use. If you decrease the drug use, regardless of the depression, the condom attitudes, and the partnership, you have an effect on the unprotected sex. Do you have any insight as to whether or not mental health may be impacting the drug use? I'm wondering if you just, like you're going with drug use, I would say, well, maybe we take it back another step and we say, well, let's look at guys' mental health, and then that will impact their drug use and their condom use and down the line. The trick is we don't, so we, we've plotted out the same, if I go back to, um, if I, so if I go back to this, right? and I plot out their depression scores over time, we don't see this decrease. So the intervention didn't necessarily lower their depression over time, nor did stopping the drugs. But stopping the drugs over time sure did change their sex risk. And so what that says to me is, again, if I've got time and if I'm at a CBO being able to provide comprehensive services, I'm not gonna ignore the depression, I'm gonna to wanna to address it. But if I don't have much time, if I've got a limited amount of time to work with them, I'm gonna get bigger bang for my buck focusing on the substance use than I am the depression. I have another question, but I can go after someone else. <laughs> yeah, Rich. Just a, just a quick one. As you're saying about um, so people being upset that it was their, it was their last session, um, what, it was there any, have you thought about, I don't know, let me put my sociologist hat on this though too. And so you're returning people back to 
either risky networks or lack of a network. I mean, was there, is there any thought of maybe even something like in, in terms of peer support or connecting that way, sort of a, a future bridging them then to if you can't provide services, now you're getting helping them to get a new start? Absolutely. Uh, and, and to be clear, we didn't just say, this is your fourth session, bye, see you in, you know, a few weeks for your, your follow-up assessment. We did provide them with a refer we provided everybody, regardless of which condition they were in, with a referral package, which indicated support groups. We also, when we give a referral package, we, excuse me, we have looked into and investigated every referral that we give. So we don't just say, there's a support group down the street. We've had one of our staff either go to the support group or we've had a previous participant say the support group is really good. We've checked it out to make sure that it's, because the last thing you want to do is give somebody who's, you know, struggling with these things still a bad recommendation because that could just kill it. Um, so we gave everybody a referral package of, of um, providers who would continue to work with them, particularly around depression or other things if they wanted that, folks who were working on a sliding scale, gay affirmative therapists, support groups at the center, 12-step um, pro, I mean, we gave them a, a pretty thick referral package um, for everybody. This is, I mean, the way we do our trials is in a very controlled, I don't want to call it a laboratory because we're, you know, a research center sort of in the community and our staff are reflective of the community and you walk in the door and there's, you know, great pictures of gayness in New York City and it's, it's a very affirming sex positive environment. But it is, a, it is a controlled setting. It's a controlled environment. And so we, we're testing, can we give somebody four sessions and change their behavior? The next steps that we would take, now that we've proven efficacy, the next steps that we would take with this is taking this intervention and putting it in a community setting, putting it in a real world setting. Your average, you know, 22 year old young gay man is not going to, you know, come up to a research center for help. They are going to go to, you know, a community based well, organization. I think you need to do some marketing either way to get people involved. Right. But I mean, it's so the next step for us is to move to an effectiveness trial. And with that, we do take it, we package it in a way, um, we train not, you know, my doctoral students and, and therapists to deliver the intervention, we train the actual staff at the clinic or CBO or whoever we're going to work with to implement this. We train them to deliver it. We provide, you know, technical assistance, we provide, you know, supervision for them, and then we test it in that setting to see does it work in the real world. Um, <coughs> We're not a completely non-real world, but we're far from being real world. So we, I think it's better that, like, for example, our space is not located in, the, in a university. It's located around the corner from Macy's in this kind of innocuous building, which is great because you walk in and if somebody sees you walking in there, it's not like, oh, you're going into a gay place or an AIDS place or a drug place or anything like that. It's, it's, you could be going into you know, a yoga studio, which is two floors above us. Um, so from that perspective, it is located in the community. You don't have to navigate coming into, you know, an academic institution that people are sterile and all that. But it's not a place that provides ongoing services. And, and my thing is, you know, what I would love to do is, is have an even stronger effect from three to six months to really see even more decreases there. And I think the way you accomplish that is by booster sessions, by integrating this into ongoing care. And other studies of motivational interviewing have shown that's when it's most successful, is when it's, you don't just give them four sessions and then never deal with them again. You give them four sessions, and then every time they come back to see you for whatever it is, to pick up more condoms, to get another HIV test, to get an, you know, an STD test, whatever, they meet with the provider who does a little bit more MI each time. Um, and that's how you sort of sustain bigger effects over time. And so that would be our next step with this type of intervention. We've, we've done that with another intervention focused on positives um, around their medication adherence and alcohol. We just got funded to put that into um, an HIV clinic setting now to move to an effectiveness trial. So we're going to sort of do the same thing with this. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have two quick questions. Uh, the first is um, I was amazed at how you were able to get the data by the day there, wondering um, if the participants actually filled out diaries for that or if they just recalled every day for the last 90 days? Great question. It, it, it is based on recall. Um, we're now doing some studies where we have them do diaries. We have them do daily. They, um, they get an email and they click on a link and they enter it um, every day. Um, there are some challenges with that um, from a methodological perspective, but also um, 
there's a certain level of reactance that happens. It's like when I know, so you know, I know I'm going to get this email at you know eight o'clock tomorrow morning asking me about my sex, and it's ten o'clock at night, and I haven't had sex yet. Maybe I should go ahead and try to have some sex because I'd really hate to have to fill that out tomorrow and say I did nothing. So we, we worry about that in terms of, of collecting it on a day level. Obviously, you're dealing with retro, you know, retrospective self-reports, and there's a lot of sort of challenges with that. Um, when we would set up the calendar, we would try to use um, a lot of memory aids so that we would, we would sort of personalize the calendar with them. We would go through the process and um, sort of say, okay, were there any big events that happened um, in this past month? Um, you know, did, was there a party you went to? Did you have vacation? Were there any holidays? Um, when we're dealing with drug use, we indicate what days do you get paid? Um, because often drug use increases immediately after paydays. Um, those sorts of things as a way to help prompt the recall. Um, and then they've done some studies to show just sort of doing this retroactively. How does it correlate if you were to be collecting it on a day-by-day -day basis? And there's a, a there's a trick with the amount of time. We used to do this for 90 days. We used to do this for the past three months. And first of all, the participants hated it because it was like, Jesus, God, I, I, you know, sure, I had sex with him six weeks ago. I don't remember. Um, 30 days is a reasonable amount of time. And the correlation between this from a retrospective and prospective 30 days is very high. You go back much further than 30 days and you're getting really sort of wonky data. The other thing is that our folks are really trained in not reacting to these things. You want to make sure that you're setting up a situation where the person can feel like they can be honest and say, this was a busy day. I was a big old slut on this day and not have a research assistant to go, <gasps> or you know, have that sort of reaction that then may change how they continue to respond. And so we do a lot of training with our folks on sort of collecting the data. We also audio tape this, and we do supervision with our folks around the delivery of this. So we spend a lot of time kind of addressing the quality of the data collection. Um, but it's tough, and I can't even tell you from an analytic standpoint how they do. They go off into some little back room in our area and come out with, you know, things that they then have to draw pictures for me because I don't understand it otherwise. Um, but they, we have two statisticians who, like, eat, drink, and sleep this stuff. It's a little crazy from my perspective. But and you have another question. Yeah, just real quick. Um, you mentioned that you guys were looking at moderators now. Um, have you uh, started looking at maybe um, historical sexual abuse um, that's a great question. We do have childhood sexual abuse. We have um, all of the characteristics of what have been conceptualized as the syndemics model that, that is related to risky sex and serial conversion among gay men, which is childhood sexual abuse, depression, which we obviously have, um, partner violence, which is a, a, we're going to analyze particularly with the subset who are partnered, um, and uh, did depression, drug use, which is obviously in there, but also sexual compulsivity. Um, which we also have. And so we are going to look at all of those as moderators. Yeah? You don't have um, like actual serial conversion rates as an indicator. Is that something that you think is worthwhile, or can you just rely on general incidence rates in, in that population? Well, we did, we did not, right, we did not test them. Um, we debated about this, and our concern was the disincentive to participation that being tested could actually lead to. Um, obviously, if we were to implement this, you know, our next step in an effectiveness trial, we'll be able to use biological outcomes because anywhere we would implement this for an effectiveness trial would be doing STI and HIV testing because they would be going to that place for those kinds of services in part. Um, so, I mean, it'll be really interesting to see that type of effect. We did ask them at each follow-up to self-report if they had been HIV tested, and we did have some seroconversions. I can't remember. It, it, it didn't seem to be more than you would expect, naturally, based on the, the incidence rates in New York City among this population, um, but we definitely had people who indicated they had um, gone to be tested and tested positive. <laughs> um, alcohol, did you control for it at all? My experience and um, 
<laughs> research is that guys are often drinking when they're doing coke or any of those other substances. So how much is that impacting? Absolutely. We did look at alcohol. We are looking at alcohol. One of the stupid things about the United States, one of many, is the National Institutes of Health has one branch for alcohol and one branch for drugs. That's changing theoretically. They're going to integrate and create this new institute. We'll see if that ever actually happens. There's a lot of politics at play there. The alcohol people like their little fiefdom being separate. So when you apply to NIDA, which is what we did, they want your outcome to be drugs. When you apply to NIAAA, they want your outcome to be alcohol. We assessed alcohol. We did not assess alcohol in general, we assessed binge drinking. So in the timeline follow back, any day in which they had five or more drinks in, in one day did get coded for a binge drinking day, and so we are analyzing that. Okay. No. That will come separate and in another paper because we want to make the people who gave us the money happy first, and then we look at the stuff that we're really interested in. But I completely agree with you, and it frustrates me that alcohol tends to get sort of ignored and forgotten, because the fact of the matter is, I believe it was 99% of them reported alcohol use in the past 30 days, and something like 80% of them had at least one binge day. So not just you know a little alcohol use, but at least five drinks in a day is, is also the norm in this sample. Uh, the other question was around partners and uh, referring to the Sullivan study, of course. It was a bit controversial for me. I thought there was some issue with how they were defining partner in that. Um, because you called it committed relationships once, and I just, not to call you out, but I don't think they were necessarily measuring committed relations as we define monogamous or committed. Like, I think a lot of them are in open relationships. And well, keep in mind, a committed them. relationship can be open. Right, okay. You're <laughs> committed to your partner and a few other people. It, it's, that's, I mean, we've, we've just started, we've now published a bunch of papers on types of relationships, and we've also come up with this term monogamish. <laughs> because there's a huge group of guys who they have their partner and then they have sex with other people but with their partner and they think that that's monogamy right. and our argument is it's monogamish so my question was <laughs> you noted like a, a significant decrease in UAI yes this is what all of this data so far is with casual partners, right? The next layer is to take just those with main partners and see here's, here's the, the, the trick if you will um, there were very few people in the study who only had a main partner. The, so the, the idea of... That's a problem with Sullivan's study too, right? Or not a problem, but it's a variable. It has to, monogamy doesn't create HIV. It has to come from somewhere, right? Well, so but monogamy can create HIV if you stop using condoms before you've both been tested and made sure that you're negative. Yeah. Even, that, even in that monogamous relationship, you can have serial conversion. But because of that... The intervention content emphasized casual partnerships. Were the therapists able to talk with them about their main partner? Yes, but they were also, you know, it was like, so this is what you do with main partner, now let's talk about your other partners. And so the intervention was not sort of focused on main partner sex the way it was. The other thing is the Sullivan thing came out after we'd already started the intervention. So we weren't, we didn't feel comfortable like, changing it and sort of saying, okay, now therapists, you know, let's do an extra session focused on the main partnerships and the risks that may be going on there. So that's sort of a weakness of this that we can't really look at that. Um, the whole committed relationship and, I mean, I would be skeptical of Patrick's study if it were not for Brian Mastansky's study that just came out and showed the same thing and two other studies that are showing very similar results. Um, I, I buy it now. Okay. Do you think it's open relationships or do you think it's the notion that you said two guys coming together and they're not getting tested? I think it's all of those things. I think it's everything. Um, we are now the, is it the CDC? Is it the F is somebody who, 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 one of our big deciding bodies in the United States is um, going to start recommending uh, couples HIV counseling and testing as the, the standard for men in relationships in the U.S. Um, so we're now sort of trying to look at how can we take motivational interviewing, integrate that into couples counseling and testing in a way that it's not just about, because my feeling is you've got two members of a couple in here. The data shows six months from now the likelihood of them still being in that couple, pretty low, particularly this age group, right, because serial monogamy tends to be, you know, the norm. My thing is, what can I do with them? I have them both in the room. I want to focus on 
not just what are they doing with each other as a couple, but what are they doing in general. That's an opportunity to deal with the you know, advantages of condom use, the substance use, sort of all of those kinds of things. It's, it sort of creates you know, a teachable moment, if you will, to address that. There, uh, well, um, Patrick Shrew came and trained um, our group, GMHC, Callan Lord, and um, a couple of other uh, groups on doing the couples testing. So those are the ones that are going to start leading with that. The, our issue is getting DOH to, to come on board with, with doing that. Um, and once the CDC says that's what you need to do and CDC controls their funding, they'll get on board whether they want to or not. I've got time for one more question. Yeah. Sir, I was really interested in the therapeutic relationship. So you're using masses and PhD students, but you said you want to operationalize it and teach MI techniques to staff. And I'm wondering, in teaching that MI component, do you teach the therapeutic relationship, or is that a whole part of the training of right. those PhD students? So I do a lot of I do a lot of motivational interviewing training. And the easiest people for me to train to do good, high-quality motivational interviewing are the people who have never been a therapist. It's harder for me to teach therapists to not do what they're used to doing in therapy. You know, the number of times in supervision would be like, stop talking about their mother. Their mother is not in the study. They are. It's, you know, therapists are trained from a certain orientation and usually not one in which motivational interviewing is the base. So I actually have a lot better success with folks without a lot of, of counseling training. We've also now done some studies. We did a study in Detroit where we trained um, HIV positive peer outreach workers and master's level counselors, mostly MSWs, um, to go into the field and try to do engagement and care with HIV positive youth. And they, they recorded their sessions on a little recorder. They sent them to us for coding to see how good of quality was their delivery of MI. And I trained all of them. Um, and then our coders would code but not know which were the peers and which were the, the therapists. The peers were slightly better in doing MI and the outcomes were equivalent. So my thing is I don't, I don't need, when, when, again, when I'm testing it at this level because I have to have so much control and I need to have you know, weekly supervision with these folks to make sure they're not, that they're doing what I need them to do, I go with you know, master's and PhD level trained therapists because they've worked with me and by that point I've knocked all the mother stuff out of most of them. Um, but to move this into an effectiveness trial, I would be working with wh whatever staff would be typically talking about these issues with these clients in their setting, whether that's you know, outreach workers, whether that's health educators, whether that's nurses, whatever. Um, the, the version of this that we're taking into HIV clinics, we're training the nurses and the social workers because they're the ones who deal with the adherence to medication issues with positive populations. So those are the people then we want to train to do this intervention. Great, thank you. Well, everyone, thank you.